I'm uh, starting to record the session because we need the uh, button to record. Now we are recording. <laughs> I was, uh, as I was saying, um, job crafting was developed in order to develop new concepts. Uh, and one of the first concepts that arose from uh, job crafting was leisure crafting. Some authors came out to realize that crafting work is sometimes just not enough to pursue one's vocation and ideal condition for life. Because we can also be active in our leisure time. Leisure can also be crafted. Why should we only talk about work, about our job, when we can be also proactive at the leisure time and uh, try to achieve some of the goals that we have in our leisure time, right? So this concept is uh, quite new. It has uh, very educated. But uh, I think it's quite interesting because individuals seek fulfillment and shape their leisure activities by addressing their passions and values, the same way as job crafters shape their jobs to fit their preferences and values. There is a parallelism to what we do in the job and what we do in our free time. So, what is leisure crafting? If we want to have a definition, in the, one of the seminal papers of leisure crafting, they describe it as the proactive pursuit of leisure activities targeted at goal setting, human connection, learning, and personal development. Okay, four, four legs of uh, leisure crafting goal setting, human connection, connecting with others, learning, and personal development. As you can see, they are all proactive aspects of human life, right? You engage proactively by your own initiative. Proactive, um, sorry, leisure crafting is proactive. It comes from the employee or the person. We are talking about the leisure time. We don't necessarily have to talk about the employee. and talk in general people. All the people can be uh, crafting their leisure, leisure time. Leisure crafting is also intentional. It's not something that just happens. No. From the, from the person that proactively thinks of a way to craft their leisure. It is serious. Even when we are talking about leisure, uh, people that craft their leisure is seriously. So it is a serious aspect of human life. Okay? It includes companionship and, activi uh, companionship and activities and development of interpersonal relationships. It, uh, one of the legs that I was commenting is a human connection. Some of the job, uh, sorry, the leisure crafting can be building those social relationships in order to to have a richer human network at, the, at your leisure time. And individuals learn new things and develop new challenges that promote their sense of mastery in an area. Okay? It's about learning. It's about developing. Don't stop being active at work. There you work in your leisure time, you can continue being proactive and learning and developing yourself. This is an example here. A worker who in her free time volunteers in a soup kitchen. Is uh, giving yourself to others, building socially, something for the community. You are crafting your leisure in a, in a way that benefits the community, right? Employee who at the end of his day spends an hour a day writing a novel. As you can see, uh, there is an important stress on uh, human connection and social interactions, but it doesn't have to be always uh, socially related. You can do uh, individual activities also, and that is considered also leisure crafting, as long as it's proactive, intentional, and serious. For you. Spends weekends studying a master's degree in ancient history to acquire meaningful knowledge. Something that the person does to enrich himself, to learn, to develop himself, right? In this uh, paper by Petra Bakker, one of the seminal papers, as I was saying, they uh, put an example, since it's a new concept, they, they illustrate it with this example that I'm going to reproduce here. Two people that participate in a play. We have Tom and we have Amanda. Tom 
goes to the theater route once a week. His motivation is the satisfaction he gets from the experience, but he's not really uh, fully motivated. Really, someone told him, uh, would you like to join this group? And he said, okay, I have nothing else to do. But he's not really 100% involved in the task, but he's okay with that. It's just participation in a leisure activity. The difference with the leisure crafting, let's see what Amanda does. She goes to the theater of group almost every afternoon. She takes care not only of the acting, but also the scenery, the dressing, the makeup, uh, uh, the, the lines that everybody has. She helps print in the, the streets, etc. etc. Her motivation is satisfaction. Same as Tom, but goes beyond that. Also, to perform an excellent play at the end, he's fully engaged into, into his activity. He is doing leisure crafting. In this case, we are not just talking about a participation in a leisure activity that is more or less casual, but is a proactive behavior that she is enacting. It's even probably an idea of hers to do this, this play, right? So with this example, I think that you can see a little bit better the difference between job and leisure craft. So why do we craft our leisure? There are some theories about this process. There's not still an answer because as you can see, we are talking about very recent concepts, right? We have on the one hand the spillover theory says that the job characteristics are spilled over to leisure. An active job activates us for active leisure. If you are a person that is naturally active, or if you are not naturally active but you get activation from work, it is reasonable to think that you are going to transfer or spill over that activation to your leisure time. You're already activated, so you just continue being activated at your leisure time. On the other hand, we have compensation theory that says exactly the opposite, which is interesting. Theory says that the characteristics of work are compensated by leisure. If you have a passive job, that activates us for active leisure. It's a way to compensate what you don't have at your job. If you have a job that is not really active, not really activating you. You will try to compensate that by looking for something that activates you in your leisure time. The two theories that we still have to see which one is the more correct or the one that gets more support in the literature. So let's think of uh, what's happening in the example that we were talking at the beginning. Do you think? Uh, in the case of Alexandros and Alexandra, the spillover theory is working or the compensation theory is working. Remember that Alexandros was not doing job crafting, but was doing leisure crafting. Alexandra was doing job crafting, but was not engaging in leisure crafting. I leave this question here for you to think, and maybe you can answer later in the question section. And I need you to reflect on that. Probably. There are some preliminary conclusions about the study of your crafting and leisure crafting on the hand of your crafting. In a meta analysis in 2017, we found that it predicts highly job satisfaction and work engagement. So it's a positive thing to try to implement in our organization. It also predicts in some amount self-reported job performance and contextual performance. We already know about these uh, performance concepts because we talked yesterday about them. And stress at work, in this case, negative. And it also predicts a little bit other reported job performance, like, for example, super supervisor reported job performance intention to lead also negative. It's a promising concept that we need to study further. 
As for leisure crafting, there has been a little bit less research so far. But what we seem to have discovered so far is that there are conditioning factors and influencing variables that affect uh, leisure crafting, like the autonomy that you have at work or the tension that you have at work. Autonomy at your home, sorry, and the tension that you have at work. So there is greater leisure crafting in ways of tension at work when you have sufficient autonomy at home. You don't have autonomy at home because maybe you have a lot of obligations at home. You, you cannot do so much leisure crafting and this makes a, a little bit of sense because you need to pay attention first to your obligation and then you are able to craft your leisure. I demands at home predict low your uh, leisure crafting. Leisure crafting leads to greater satisfaction with the needs for affiliation and autonomy. We were saying one of the components of uh, leisure crafting was uh, exactly uh, the social uh, relations, right? So it helps with the affiliation needs, helps with autonomy. But let's not stay here because in the recent years, very, very recently, there have been new constructs, new crafting that are derived from the fact of leisure and job crafting that are worth mentioning here at least, even when there hasn't been so much research because they are in these later years. It's worth mentioning. Because not all the activities that we do outside work are leisure, right? It's family, there is home obligations, there is shopping to do. If, uh, one of our relatives gets sick, we need to take care of that person. We need to do cleaning, we need to wash up, we need to go shopping. We need to take care of our home, of our, our relatives. It's not all leisure, so everything you do outside your job is not leisure, there are other things. So we need a concept to address things that are not leisure, but are done in a non-work. So we came up, or the authors came up with the concept of home crafting. What is home crafting? As defined uh, theoretically. To hear the definition, it's the changes that the employees make to balance their home demands and home resources with their personal abilities and needs in order to experience, meaning, and create the or restore the person environment. You can see it is a technical definition, but it is a parallelism with a job crafting definition. It's actually the same. You are aligning your, uh, your home behaviors with your preferences and preferences and values in order to, to get a better fit between your preferences and values and your home uh, activities or obligations, okay? It is sometimes referred to as non-workplace crafting or non-job crafting because, as I was saying, not uh, everything that we do Outside the job is leisure, and also there is another one that is worth mentioning that not all home crafting is developed at home. Because, for example, if you go shopping, it's something for the home, but you do, do not do it at home. And if you take a, a relative to the hospital because he or she is sick, it's not something that you do at home. We fall into the home crafting definition, but if we want to be more accurate, talk about non-workplace crafting to, to address everything that is outside job, right? Examples. After I work, for examples of us to measure this. After work, I make sure I can decide how to do things. And you can see it's quite broad, quite general, in order to address everything that is done after work or outside work. Look for challenging tasks and activities to do outside of work. Since I came home from work today, doing a daily basis measurement, I made sure that the activities I did after work were emotionally less intense. Okay, you are trying to craft your emotions in this case. But why should we stay only with job crafting? 
home practice, with leisure practice. We can see that these uh, contests are quite watertight. Uh, the, the crafting are seen actually as a part of a whole, which is life. Life comprises all the crafting. Life comprises, comprises leisure, comprises home, comprises your non-work. So why can't we also introduce life crafting uh, construct? This uh, brand new concept uh, I think it was in 2022. Uh, that encompasses the characteristics of the other craftings, law, leisure, and home. In the literature, I also found some references to conciliation crafting, but I don't want to talk about that because there's, so, there's not so much about that. But it's all, it would be also included in life crafting, right? So we have another concept here, which is the more general, the, the broadest, of all of them, which is life crafting. What is life crafting? That crafting, as I was saying, can be considered life crafting applied to a particular domain. And uh, the definition is the conscious efforts that individuals make to create meaning in their lives through. And the authors have found three dimensions that are the following cognitive crafting, in social support, and seeking challenge. Cognitive crafting refers to cognitively reframe how they view life. We already talked about this cognitive crafting related to job crafting, as I mentioned, of job crafting, which is the your perception of the job. In this case, it would be about life. Seeking social support, we have also seen this variable about human connection, about social relationships. We also have it here in life crafting. Seeking social support systems to manage life challenges, okay? And also seeking challenges, actively seeking challenges to facilitate personal growth. So in order to, to grow, develop as a person, you seek things that are not too difficult, that are not too easy, but they help you grow as a person. So the authors of this uh, concept in the seminal article of 2022 found some correlations, uh, some promising co correlations, because it seems that uh, life crafting could be an antecessor or antecedent of meaning of life, mental health, which would be very interesting if, if this is confirmed, work engagement, which, which is very interesting for business. And burnout reduction, which also, which is also very, very interesting. So you see here a uh, scheme of all the craftings, the four craftings that we have been talking about up until now. We have uh, on the top the three domains that we talked about: work, also non-work is leisure and non-work that is non-leisure. So in the work domain, we have job crafting. The non-work leisure time, we have leisure crafting. And in the non-work leisure and in the non-work non-leisure, we have home crafting. So home crafting, as I was saying, is comprising the leisure and the non-leisure that we do outside our jobs. I think that you can see it very clearly in this, in this slide. The home crafting is, is uh, comprising true spirit of our lives, right? And we have uh, at the bottom life crafting that uh, comprises everything, all the craftings and all the spheres of human human activity, uh, not work, and if it's uh, leisure or not leisure. So, once we have came up with a very interesting concept like the life crafting, how can we promote life crafting? It would be the, the natural question to, to answer. The obvious answer would be to pay attention to its components. Have the cognitive crafting, then let's try to cognitively reframe how we view life. Have seeking social support. Let's try to build our social relations. Uh, let's seek social support, manage life challenges. And we have seeking challenges. Let's actively seek challenges to facilitate personal growth. 
we want to be a little bit more structured and specific. It's a intervention uh, that is uh, made by uh, c setup. Even when I said that the concept was from 2022, you know that the concepts are developed throughout time. And one of the uh, seminal articles was this one in 2019 that, that already talked a little about uh, in a way of uh, life crafting. So uh, these authors proposed an intervention of seven stages, and it's basically writing writing down in a piece of paper uh, the, the instructions that is uh, that I'm going to describe in each of the cases. It's firstly designed for students, but it can be perfectly other adaptable for any any person who is uh, studying, working, or whatever the situation is. And we are going to go to uh, all these cases from one to seven, and let's go one by one. First one would be to discover our values and passion. So the idea would be to write down what you like to do in general. This will be from, let's go from general to specific kind of relationships you have in both in your private and your work life. Think about your social sphere. What kind of career would you like to have? What kind of jobs would you like to have? Uh, what lifestyle choices have you done? What lifestyle choices would you like to do? You need to distinguish what you would like to do and what you find important. It can be two different things, but the ideal thing would be that they match. They would be the same thing. You like to do something that is also important. Uh, that's the best fit, right? So we start thinking about uh, our values and passion in order to start thinking and start signing proactively our behavior in life in general, right? And when this is um, designed for students, we can do this at any stage of our lives. It doesn't matter that we are 35 years old, we have two children, we are married, it doesn't matter. We can also, also uh, do this in order to rethink about some aspects that can be changeable. Not all of them can be changeable at our stage. But we can rethink about them and maybe one or some of them we can, we can do something about. The second step would be to think about the gap that there is between the current and the versus the future state, current and desired competencies and habits. So the idea would be to write down about the qualities you admire in others, competencies that they have or you would like to acquire, and habits that you like or dislike. It's a little bit about thinking uh, what you have and you would like to have. In the sense of qualities, competencies, and habits. You need to be aware of your habits and reflect on them in order to start working on it. Even if you need to break some of the habits, the first thing you need to do is to realize about them. It is very important that you think of self concordant goals to elicit behavioral changes. Self concordant goals, as I said in a previous session, are the goals that are aligned with our values and preferences. You can see we talked a lot about values and preferences when we talked about job crafting, about life crafting, about home crafting. It's all about aligning our behaviors, our activities with our own preferences and individual values. The third step would be to write down about the present and the future social life. Talk about social connections here. We need to write down about the relationships that energize and de energize you. That energize and de energize you. The kinds of friends and acquaintances that are good for you, the kinds of friends and acquaintances you would like to have in the future. As you can see, all the time, actively thinking in advance. It's not just getting carried away by their circumstances practically planning your life. That's uh, the whole idea behind this intervention. 
write down about uh, your ideal family life and broader social life. How it would be look like. It's not just to. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, get carried away. No, I'm gonna proactively decide on my life. Okay, rethink rationally. What do I want with my life? In this case, about my social relationships. Want a family? Do I not want a family? Do I want to get married? These kind of questions. People, anyway, with a strong social network, live longer and healthier. That's what in the literature of uh, mental health has found. If we are not talking about quantity. We are usually talking about quality. And the difference is more accentuated. Age. We get older. The quality of the relationships is more important than the quantity. So take that in mind. Avoid high maintenance relationships that affect us negatively. Sometimes we just can't let go of a relationship that is not good for us. Okay, so we need to think about this and maybe take a decision that it can be painful but it's good for us, right? The fourth point would be thinking about our future career. Let's talk about our jobs. It would be to write down about is important in my job? Is it that you like to do? Uh, professionally speaking, what kind of colleagues do you want to have? Whom do you want to meet through your work? It's about reflecting about your job and proactively thinking about what would, it, would you like it to be. Don't let daily hassles make decisions for you. You need to be the one making decisions. Proactively think about what you want in your job. Probably other, with other areas too, because we know that uh, our non-work area affects work and work affects non-work. So we need to have a, because we are talking about life crafting, which comprises all the spheres of our life. We need to think about all the spheres. That's why we are differentiating here, because we talked before about social relationships. We are talking here about job so let's talk separately but in the end we need to integrate think as a whole how each of the spheres affect each other i take this job is it going to affect my ideal of a family of uh, or if i take this decision uh, in relation to social relations is going to affect my uh, employment opportunities in the career that i want to think about these things, if we want to be proactively uh, uh, a life crafting perspective, right? Five point, according to the authors, is the key element of said another. It's to think about the ideal future versus future if you do not take action. So the idea would be to write down about the best possible possible self. And future when there are no constraints. Contrast this with future if changes are not made, if no changes are made. Let's compare my life if I take proactive decisions and compare that to the life that I would have if I don't do anything and I just get carried away and I let others or the circumstances which it was the decisions for you. Write about it in three domains personal, relation, relational, and professional. It's key that the future you envisit is subtracted. Of course, if we are talking about uh, channeling our activities in all the life domains, but something that we want, that vision of the future must be attractive to us. It doesn't make sense that we, that we do all the It's obvious, it needs to be attractive. So to formulate plans of how to achieve your desired future and contrast it in your mind with an undesired one. Make plans, start always making plans. Don't let circumstances take control. Imagine your future if you don't do anything. Okay? Sometimes in this modern society, plenty of stimuli, we don't take time to think and reflect about our life or any of the domains of our life, job, relations, uh, leisure. So the idea behind this intervention is to proactively think about all the aspects of our lives. The sixth point 
it is goal attainment and if then plans. You need to have plan B. Okay. It would be to write down about formulating, strategizing, and prioritizing concrete goals, defining goals, write down your life goals, identifying and describing ways to overcome obstacles, because obstacles are going to show up always. Yeah. Always obstacles. So we need to have uh, ideas how to overcome them. And the most probable ones, uh, we need to think about them, how to overcome those. Of course, we cannot view all of them, but the main ones we can do. Make your progress towards goals. Let's think daily about how close we are to our goals. Those must be self concordant as I said, fit your values and interests. And they should be smart goals. I'm going to talk about smart goals in the next slide. Find if then plans. What happens if my plan A uh, collapses or is impossible? Or and with all my efforts, I couldn't develop plan A? You should think of a plan B. Why not? Something that we also want to do, of course, it must be also attractive to us. And it would be a very good idea to, to have this plan. What are smart goals? Smart goals, this is quite uh, strengthened in the literature. And each of the letters of smart refer to a specific characteristics of goals in order to, uh, to be um, achievable or uh, easy to. to to achieve at the end. Yes, refers to specific as a contrast to general goals that are not very specified. We need to have as concrete as possible goals. Goals clear and specific. Okay. We need to be measurable because if we don't make it measurable, how can we know if we have achieved, achieved them or not? Maybe we have achieved them, but we uh, state our goals in such an abstract way that we cannot be sure if we have achieved them or not. It should be attainable. It needs to be realistic, something that we can really or achieve. If you set as your goal to fly to the moon, maybe if you are an astronaut, that could be uh, an attainable goal. But if you are not, that would, wouldn't be attainable. That wouldn't be realistic. So design attainable goals. Should be relevant, but relevant for you, according to your preferences and values. Verify that your goals are relevant for you, that they are important, that they are meaningful for you. Okay? They should be time based. You should put a date in your calendar in order to, to have a date, a deadline, because otherwise we can procrastinate and even a goal during our entire life. And we never achieve it because we procrastinate and we never get there. And the last point is public commitment, commitment to goals. So, what the authors propose is to make a public statement, public commitment, even a photo with a statement would be a good idea to communicate the rest of the, the world or your contents or your colleagues, uh, friends, family, that you have a goal and that you plan to achieve it. Indicating goals to friends, to workers, and relatives, etc. Why should we do that? Because literature says that public commitment can enhance goal attainment. You publicly commit to something, it is more difficult that you take back that goal people will start asking you how was that that you wanted to do how, how are you doing that how did you stop doing that there's a social pressure in order to do that that you committed to do like for example if you if one of your goals is to make an exercise and to go to the gym a good idea would be to make a picture and say my goal is to Go to the gym every day, three times, for example. Or even meet with someone uh, to go to the gym. And if you stop doing that, that person, of course, will note it because you are missing and will ask you. And the social pressure maybe will make you rethink of 
not going to the gym, saying that you don't really feel like going. Okay. So the idea is to use the fantasized idea of future, to reduce goals, and to formulate a strategy to reach these goals. So as I was saying, the idea behind is to not get carried away by life circumstances. Proactively design a strategy to achieve your goals according to your ideal future that you already thought about in the first stages of the intervention. Finally, participants commit to their intentions by having example, like a photo taken to accompany their, their goal statement is then made public and by social pressure it's more difficult that you take back that life goal in design. Okay. So like uh, I did in the previous session, I throw some uh, questions for you to reflect. You don't need to answer here, but if you want, you can do of course, and we can discuss any any details that uh, we went through in the in the presentation. Um, before that, I would like to read a sentence to describe uh, summarizing. Sometimes we just get carried away by circumstances and end up doing things that we don't want or find ourselves in unwanted situations. Being proactive in the different spheres of our life can avoid getting to that. So I think I repeat it often. The idea is that to proactively plan the main decisions of your life. I'm not saying that you must plan everything that you have because there are important things and other things that are not so much. So you need to have a plan for the important things, not for everything. In order to have uh, an ideal life uh, as much as possible, and that would be a craft in your life, in other words. So I throw these questions to you. Do you craft your work? Do you craft your leisure? Do you craft your home in the sense of on the workplace crafting, including leisure and obligations at home or non-home, outside home, related to to home? You know, do you craft your life? So if you want to answer these questions, I'm, I'm open to discuss anything with you, these questions or other. Um, uh, the same I did in the previous uh, presentations. I'm also uh, showing here the measurements that we have in the literature. In this case, it's these variables are, are quite new, especially home crafting and light crafting. There are, there are less uh, instruments, but you can see here the main measurements that you can find in literature. I was going to just maybe one exercise that we could do is in the questions you raised about what area you craft. Maybe we could make a show of hands how many people craft in their home, just to get a feeling. Okay, I don't know if you heard what Professor Robert Duval said, but he had a very good idea. Let's try to do that. For the first question, you don't need to participate, but you can raise your hand if you craft or have crafted your job. So, anybody of you that have crafted your job, can you raise your hands to see yeah. how many of you have done? You can click the button of raising your hand to, to do this. 